how I came up with that story, I don't know. I know that I came up with the cicada as a visual metaphor, and of course they couldn't do it then, you know, and I didn't know they couldn't do it because, you know, I was a writer, <laughs> not somebody who was, you know, had to worry about the technical difficulties. What's the heck? To me, it was a, a wonderful challenge, not only great fun, but a great challenge because I was able to play both good and evil, uh, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, which is uh, enjoyable for any actor. And uh, plus, I uh, really admired uh, Philippe Mora. I had seen uh, um, Mad Dog Morgan, which I thought was fantastic, and uh, Brother Can You Spare a Dime, and you know, uh, he was no slouch, so you know, I, uh, and it produced by the same producer of the Omen series, and, you know, not too shabby. I'd done uh, King Kong, Logan's Run, so we'd done some, some creature films, and we'd already done The Deer Hunter, so um, blood and all of that was pretty easy. What was my character in The Beast with him? Now, I, when when F Philippe called, it, I don't think it had been thrust, flushed out really well, but I think he was uh, um, sort of interested in his daughter. He was probably as interested in his daughter, Kitty, as he was his wife. What you doing here, girl? We are just taking us a little walk, Pa. It's a cool movie. It's a cool movie, and we were cutting edge of what special effects were doing at that time. <laughs> How did I get involved with The Beast Within? Harvey Bernhardt had liked some spec script I'd written, and he asked me in, and he had bought this book proposal. The book was not written, and it was he bought it because of the title, The Beast Within, because he specifically wanted to do a physical transformation of a man into a monster. So I was signed to write The Beast Within off the title, and the only given was there had to be a, a, a transformation. So the, what I had used was the cicada or the katydids, which, 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 come out, which are reborn every 13 and 17 years, depending on the, on the, the, the type of, of cicada, and they shuck their exoskeleton and step forward into the world as these rather pretty winged insect creatures they mate, and then they die, which I thought was a great metaphor for, uh, for, uh, for, what, for what Michael was going through. It's all Freudian, it's all sec you know, you know, psychosexual. It, it, it echoes the desperation to, 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 to continue on down through the generations, the, the the conflict that Michael feels because he falls in love with Amanda Platt, and yet, you know, this, this lovely, lovely teenage girl his age, and yet he knows this, this monster inside is going to kill, kill her because she's a Kerwin, because the, the, the beast wants revenge on the, on, the, on the family. I mean, look, look at what you have in it. You have cannibalism. Billy Connors, he, he is starved to death. One of the Kerwins kept him prisoner and starved him, and then when he, when he was dying of starvation, killed his wife and threw her, the woman that, that Billy Connors loved, who was chained in the, in the cellar, he throws the dead bo body down, so he, he, he's forced to eat the, 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 the flesh of his beloved woman, I'm, I'm, and then feeds him for 17 years on, 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 on corpses, robbed from the, I mean, it is horrible. <coughs> So yes, it's, it's, it's full of all of these gothic, you know, you know, moments and themes. And, and yet, finally, it, the beast within is about young love. You feel from Michael, the boy who's, who's, who's falling in love, and of course, every time he gets, he gets close to her and he gets excited by Amanda, you know, you know which is to say every time, you know, his, he, you know, he starts to harden, the, the beast inside of him 
emerges more and more. And he, he, so he's, his lust is commensurate with the desire to kill her and eat her. I mean, I mean, I mean it's madness. I, I don't know how I ever got away with it. Whoever killed the others is going to come for you, Amanda. I was then and still am uh, a fan of horror films. So getting the role in The Beast Within was uh, kind of a dream come true for me, really, uh, in that, um, you know, I also got to play the monster. In fact, I, <laughs> part of my insistence up front was that I could actually be in the final costume because I knew they'd probably get a stuntman for some of that. But I said, I really want to be able to do that, to be able to say I did actually play the, the final creature as well. And I said, all right. <laughs> Um, I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for by saying yes to that, but it was, uh, it was an adventure. There's the director and there's the cast and there's the crew and it's kind of like different communities within a community. And the actors are responsible to the director. Uh, many directors are like cattle herders. They just say do it and don't ask why. And there's not really much of a connection there. Philippe made it over that boundary. He was one of us. He was the leader of the Lost Boys, and we were the Lost Boys. And uh, we trusted him. I trusted him. Philippe is a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of guy. He, he will always take on a challenge. He's fast, he's creative, he's brave. Um, and his point of view is extraterrestrial, I think. I, uh, he just comes at things oddly. And his background as a documentary filmmaker, I think, adds a, an interesting perspective to the stories that he tells because it is, everything has kind of a, I think, a documentary kind of storytelling to it, the way it unfolds. And there aren't many people that maintain a style like that, but he's been true to that, that style and true to that, that freedom. Um, let's, let's just roll and see what happens. Now, I think this was 1980. And there, there was no such thing yet as effects as we understand them now. And there was certainly no CGI. There, was, there, was no, there were no computers. And the, the state of the art w w was very, very primitive. They had pneumatics, which is to say air bladders, but that was about all. And as I remember, Tom Berman wasn't even an effects man. He was a makeup man, leading edge in terms of of making people up, but not in terms of, 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 of doing transitions on screen. The state of the art at the time was, uh, was Joe Dante's The Howling, and I don't think American Werewolf in London was out yet. So they had to invent it to do it for the first time. And this, is, this in no way is a, is a, is a, is a put down on Tom Berman because he took the technology, the pneumatic technology, a step further. But it, the technology was not at the point where it could do what I wrote. The, the, the emergence of, of the beast from within Michael's body wasn't really technically doable then. The, the leading edge of, of the technology that Tom Berman was using was makeup, which is what he did, and, he, and air bladders. The puppetry, the stuff that they did, that Berman and those guys did, the, 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 the mask designs, the, the, the blood, were really intricate and really, really detailed. And, and yet, it didn't take a huge amount of time. You know, it, it, it seemed like, I'd, I've been on other science fiction, I did a, a TV series where I played a, a dog, that, a, a man that was regressing into a Rottweiler for some reason, I don't know what that was all about. But it, 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 those, it took forever to do that. And Berman and those guys were just 
so fast, so on top of it. Love Tom. He's he's uh, marvelously talented and, and as nice a guy as he is talented. And uh, he and his crew were just uh, you know fabulous to work with. Um, I at one time in, in in my life when I was a, a kid, actually earlier before I became an actor, I had wanted to become a makeup artist. So I was totally down with that and uh, I didn't mind the hours and hours in the makeup chair because I was fascinated by the process and, and enjoyed working with them on this and, uh, and they were very collaborative. The uh, interesting thing is that after um, I did that film in, in oh, I don't know, several years later I wound up working with Tom uh, doing makeup effects, uh, makeup special effects for uh, the film One Dark Night. Uh, Meg Tilly's uh, first film, as I recall, <laughs> where she's menaced by uh, various corpses that come to life through telekinesis. And I actually sculpted a couple of those corpses. This woman holding prayer beads and a Bible that comes drifting down in a white dress, that she was one of mine. And a, a, there was a little a child corpse that I worked on as well. Um, so, you know, that, uh, that was, you know, cool to be able also to work with, with uh, Tom professionally. Mechanical effects supports almost everybody on a film, uh, one way or another. Any, anything that's uh, too scary, too heavy, too dirty ends up being our job. So, uh, Tom was, a, uh, you know, I, I hadn't worked with him before, but I, I did know his work, and I'd worked with a lot of makeup artists, and uh, uh, he was an interesting guy. He might do the small stuff, and then uh, we'd, we'd supply everything else. Working with uh, Tom and his crew, the, the uh, transformation scene, that took days to shoot, about three days it took to shoot that, uh, you know, the final transformation. That was an involved process because they had to uh, take a mold of my entire body from head to toe and then separate ones for the hands and feet and face and oh my god. Uh, so, you know, that was an experience. And then um, uh, working with all the stages of the transformation. The only thing I wasn't too thrilled about, and it was a kind of stopgap thing because I think certain um, pieces hadn't arrived yet. You know, you, that's the problem when you're on location and some didn't, you know, out of the way a place, a package may not arrive or whatever, and you have to shoot that night. And they had to improvise uh, some plumpers for me. Later, I wore these marvelous fake gums that were made to fit over my own gums. My teeth were my own, and they would discolor them, but the gums, all swollen and puffy, were uh, artificial gums. And, uh, and they changed the shape of my mouth, which you can see in the film as I begin to transform. But the first night we needed to do that effect, those things hadn't arrived, so they had to make do with foam rubber pieces which were cut and stuffed in there. Unfortunately, what no one had realized was that this chemical was going to leak out from the foam and I got these like terrible like canker sores on the you know grooves of uh, the upper and lower parts of my mouth down in there you know where it's sort of sensitive it's like ah <laughs> you know? uh, fortunately we'd gotten the scenes at that point but it, uh, and and god I didn't have to do more of those plumper scenes the next day or two so they were able to heal and there was no problem but that was sort of an unexpected uh, thing there it was done in you know stages, and there was about six stages to it. And each stage would require another you know four or five hours of makeup. And at one point, I looked like William Hurt in Altered States. <laughs> that was that was an experience with all the bladders. And fascinatingly, at one point there was a mistake. Something actually went too far, and it's when my back opens up. And the thing was carried so far that, that the, the bladders became exposed, the air bladders. And one was like reddish and one was a kind of a greenish yellow. But being covered with methyl cell and all the goo, it looked fabulous. They looked like organs, weird organs being, you know, so they kept it in. It's technically a mistake, but it looks great. I remember the head starting to swell up and do its thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, there were bladders inside. We provided air. Uh, some logistic support. Whether Philippe went too far or not with, uh, with the uh, bladder effects is a matter of debate. The only time I guess he could be said to have done that possibly is with what uh, we began to call the, or what we later called the medicine ball head, a sort of weird Charlie Brown looking. <laughs> but I'll tell you why I actually really like that is because earlier in the film there's this marvelous foreshadowing of that with R.G. Armstrong, who I love, playing my doctor in the film, where he squeezes this little toy 
which were called an obi, I remember. And he'd squeeze this and the head goes just like what happens to me. So it, it, it's so exactly prefigured and foreshadowed earlier in the film that when you see that, it's kind of a full circle kind of cumulative thing. I, I find it cool. I mean, yes, it's outrageous, but you know, come on, you know, this is not uh, Dostoevsky we're doing here. Philippe has a glint in his eye that the minute he walks in a room, you know this is not going to be any ordinary day. He uh, was driven, focused. He'd get in there and you'd see, he's like, okay, and here you go. I want you to do this and I want you to do that. I was putty in his hands. I didn't do anything for him. He was great. <laughs> It was a very uh, dramatic, emotional scene. Um, there's a fine line uh, when you're portraying a character uh, that you have to, to a certain extent, experience what that character experiences. Uh, one of the job, the difference between a, an actor and a crazy person is that an actor has a definite as to what is about them and what is about the character. Sometimes you hear stories about method actors where that line gets a little too fuzzy and, and that's how you get hurt. There was a body double. Um, maybe I shouldn't admit that. But yeah, there were certain things that I was not able to do that uh, she was able to do far better. We were out in a um, pretty low-lying flat all of that part of Mississippi is kind of cold and damp, and, and uh, they had a berm and the whole rape scene, uh, the car part of it, her running through, and then uh, um, they were out in this area that you we had picked out, and uh, I remember the it's the first time we see the saw the uh, character as, as a as a monster. There was a, a guy from the, I think he was from the wardrobe department named John Lemons. Great big guy, huge. And I don't know how he did it, but he had an electric blanket out in the middle of a swamp. Must have been the longest extension cord ever. But when I would come off this, I was cold, and he'd just wrap me up. I'll never forget that, that he just, I was taken care of. She got pretty hypothermic, I think, and uh, turned kind of blue, and when we were finally done, and we were there several hours, um, helped carry her out of the place, and then uh, what was really funny is everybody had had enough that had taken off. Of course, all the principals jump in, in the car, and they're gone, and suddenly we're there with the car, and no way to, there was no way to get the, uh, the picture car, the hero car, back to town. So they asked us to take it. So we took it back to town. It was a death trap and fog and driving through that part. It was, it was a horror show on its own. It was admittedly one of the strangest scenes I've ever been asked to do. Uh, here I am having to tear the clothing off this girl. It was supposed to be um, uh, my girlfriend in the film, uh, Kitty Ruth Moffat. In fact, it was not. It was a body double. It was freezing. I felt so bad for this poor girl out in the woods at, at night. And it was so cold that when I tore her pre-torn clothing off with my beast claws, uh, steam actually rose from her skin. It was it was literally that cold. And uh, um, and I have to simulate this rape inside of this costume, which is restrictive in terms of what I could see and what I could hear. So admittedly, I, you know, I, I, I could hear Philippe kind of, you know, I could hear him, but not as clearly as I would prefer. This thing wasn't made for easy hearing or easy sight. So I'm kind of feeling my way and seeing as best I can what I'm doing. And, you know, Philippe is sort of giving me little encouragements uh, uh, how to move. And I remember him saying, uh, uh, can you come to some sort of climax? And I, I think at one point he probably grabbed me, and so he pressed me and moved me a certain way. It, it was, uh, you know, I mean, here I am in here, and it's, you know, it was sort of uh, difficult, you know, and uh, constrictive, and I did my best under the circumstances. It, it, it was, you know, strange to begin with. He was less than um, aggressive about it, and uh, and the girl was, uh, she was. Yeah, young, 20-ish, whatever, and it was very cold. 
and as it went on, he wasn't as enthusiastic as Philippe wanted. So, so I remember uh, him pressing a little throttle with his foot, <laughs> a little more uh, activity. I, I'm not sure what he, the exact words he used, but it was pretty funny. Try, everybody's trying not to giggle. She's still alive. Let's get her to the hospital. One of the things I liked about shooting on location in general is that it's really easy to climb into character, to let your whole reality become what that is. And uh, where we were, we were in this uh, little town outside of Jackson, and uh, there's a lot of camaraderie amongst the crew and the cast. And we had a lot of fun. I think we were filming six days a week, long days. Uh, it's always long days, but long days, climbing in and out of swamps. Um, it was an adventure. It was a real adventure. What's that? Down there. Oh, that's Black Pine Bog. Nobody ever goes there, though. I got stung on my eyelid, and my eye got huge. We're out in the middle of a swamp. Who knows what I was stung by? <laughs> and we had all these close-ups to do, and here I am, and I looked like the monster. I'm supposed to be the pretty one, but I look like the monster. And yeah, those makeup people got in there, and you see a lot of my profile in one point of the movie. And there was one, they gave me an antihistamine that knocked me out cold. So those scenes where you see me sleeping, I really was. It stuck me in bed and filmed around me, set me on my side so you didn't see that half of my face had this huge uh, bug bite uh, that closed my eye shut. I'm not a big fan of the South, and that Mississippi was one of the reasons why. Um, although it is beautiful, it, it's, it's just, the, the South, it's, it's, a, it's a strange place. And, um, the, uh, I remember it being pretty cold at, at night. And I do remember w one sideline story, Meshach Taylor and I wanted to go have a, have a drink and it was a dry county, we had to go to county line. So the only place that, that we knew of was this country western bar, and Meshach was going, I'm not going to a country western bar, I'm not going to, no, it's going to be all right, it's going to be all right, man. it's going to be all right. We walk in, and it was like the worst movie ever, because it just got quiet, and all the heads turned to look at Meshach. We did not belong there. It was, it was pretty frightening, and, and he was scared, and I was scared, and, and uh, to get back at me, I think, he asked me if we went down to Jackson State, I think, um, to talk to a, a, a class. And he asked if I wanted to go get some ribs. So we went into his neighborhood, and of course I was the only white person there, and, and uh, people were looking at me like they looked at him, and I go, oh, thanks, Mish, I needed that lesson. <laughs> We were uh, in, in the Mississippi State Lunatic Asylum. Now that's a correctional facility and they had an extremely high security place right there with gun emplacements and electrified fences. But the part we were filming that, sec that section for um, were the older buildings where they actually had done electroshock therapy and that was some of the, we didn't have to do a set basically walk in, put a gurney up, and, and that was it. Uh, we also went to a closed hospital that was closed due to staff. So it wasn't safe for the public, but you could bring a movie company in, of course. <laughs> Just what happens to us a lot. And uh, that was difficult. I don't think anybody wanted to be there for that. Oh boy, that was an experience and a half. Um, Especially, especially the uh, institution where we shot the uh, transformation scenes, the hospital sequences in the later part of the movie. That was shot in the Whitfield State Institution. And um, it, first of all, it looked beautiful. It was, just, it was like a, um, it looked almost like UCLA. It looked like a huge university campus. You'd have no clue that you were on the grounds of some large, you know, multi-building, you know, uh, uh, institution for, for uh, um, mentally ill people, but um, it was a, it was very creepy, 
because of the um, disused state of parts of the building. There was a basement there that was beyond belief. I went down there and found myself in this labyrinthine collection of rooms that were covered with like greenish incrustations. It looked like the whole thing had been underwater for, for, for years uh, with like barnacles on the walls. Um, uh, it had uh, equipment for like hydrotherapy. I mean, you know, we're talking turn of the century, turn of the previous century kind of stuff. Marble tables with leather straps and these frightening looking uh, uh, accoutrements sticking out of the walls, weird implements and metal things, it, it, you know torture porn kind of uh, territory, you know, scary. Um, um, and when we were shooting there, um, a couple times patients would come in in the midst of things we were doing. At one point I was uh, playing a game of catch with uh, one of the other actors using, um, I think it was Don Gordon's severed head from the film and we were like tossing this back and forth like a basketball and then we turn and look and we see this patient standing in the doorway kind of <laughs> staring at us, and, oh, <laughs> probably set his therapy back a, a bit. Um, and then uh, uh, same thing with doing the transformation scene. Here I am hooked up to all these air bladders and I'm convulsing and spewing out methyl cellulose, which they've injected into my mouth and you know, going through all of this stuff. And again, we'd turn and there would be, you know, a couple patients staring and God knows what they were thinking of us. And the, um, the head of the institution, the, he, was, he was quite a character who told us some rather memorable stories about them having, as I recall, a, a cannibal ward. And uh, yeah, like Silence of the Lambs time, very, very memorably strange. Um, there was also another hospital where we shot earlier uh, in the film. That one was haunted, apparently. Um, and, you know, you just can't uh, beat that genuine small town atmosphere. Um, now, even though we were based in Jackson, and that's where some of the interior, the interior scenes were shot, uh, there was a converted gymnasium turned into a sound stage where we shot a number of sets, the cellar being one of those sets, and so forth. Um, most of the exteriors there were shot in this little town called Raymond, Raymond, Mississippi. And that was just this authentically, you know, isolated, Lovecraftian kind of town. And uh, the atmosphere was amazing. The people were great, you know, really, really hospitable and, and friendly. Um, and so, you know, I felt comfortable in that sense, you know, but uh, it sure had uh, a memorably odd atmosphere in which to film, which, which helped the movie tremendously. I've been very fortunate in my career and I've, I've received many compliments, but the compliment that meant the most to me that I remembered all these years was when we were shooting uh, the, a series of scenes that we were out in the swamp and it was cold. It was February, so we're out there and oh, it was freezing and I'm in a little cotton dress. and. It's so cold, and so there was this little gas station that consisted of a cash register and maybe one pump and a, you know, you could buy tobacco or something. That was, that was it, and there were, it was very late at night, and I was very, very cold, and the honey wagons are a mile and a half away. And so these two old guys that sat at the gas station would play cards opened it up and allowed me to come in. And I was very grateful to get in where it was warm, and I, I sat with them, and at one point I, they were, you know, we were just chatting. Well, the accent that I used in this movie was one that I worked very hard on.